Hello the internet and welcome back to my channel. Today on the bench we have a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And I know what you're thinking, wait a minute, this is not a ZX Spectrum. Well, um, it is. Well, this is a ZX Spectrum and this is a replacement case with a keyboard for the ZX Spectrum. So the ZX Spectrum you see here comes from this enclosure here. Now, when the ZX Spectrum was released in 1982, it was mostly criticized because of the quality of the keyboard. The keys here are made of rubber and they're not great, to be honest. Uh, they're not great for anything. So someone went the extra mile to develop a replacement case with a replacement keyboard. So you could basically transplant the electronic of the computer from the original case into this new case. Now, it kind of blows my mind that someone went the extra mile to develop a case and a proper keyboard but they forgot something. Did you notice it? Yes, the space bar is missing. Well, it's not missing, it's here. It's a key. <laughs> but it's not what you would expect it. And considering this case was developed as a replacement keyboard, it's kind of weird that the keyboard is not really what you would expect. Anyways, I understand there is a, re a later release of this case which comes with a proper space bar. The ZX Spectrum was manufactured by Sinclair of uh, Clive Sinclair, a British inventor who's recently passed away and it's considered by most to be the computer which launched the British information technology industry. It features a Z80 processor and it comes with a minimum of 16 kilobytes of RAM but you could buy it with up to 48 kilobytes of RAM. You could also upgrade the 16 kilobyte version either by yourself or with some uh, extensions or you could post it to Sinclair and Sinclair would upgrade your unit and send it back to you. Now the ZX Spectrum was brought in by one of my viewers, Becca. Thank you Becca for bringing them in. So she actually brought two of them which apparently are in need of a little bit of attention. Now this is my very first ZX Spectrum I'm seeing in person. I don't really know much about them so I'm learning as I go and uh, I would say let's not waste any more time and as usual, let's see what works and what doesn't. Right, this is the uh, main PCB of the ZX Spectrum, so let's take a look at the components together. This is the CPU, the uh, Z80, and uh, this little transistor attached on top is actually from the factory and it's totally normal with the issue number two of these PCBs. On the right hand side, this is the ROM with BASIC and closer to the edge here, that's the power supply section. Now this PCB is getting 9 volts DC from a transformer here and then it's generated plus 5, minus 5 and two different 12 volts. You can see here on the right hand side there is a voltage regulator, this is a 7805 for the 5 volts. Here at the center of the PCB we have a very important chip, uh, this is called the ULA, Uncommitted Logic Array. This is replacing quite a lot of discrete logic on the PCB and it's taking care of the video, it's taking care of the memory, it's taking care of the tape in and out and also of the keyboard. On the left hand side of the ULA we got the crystals generating uh, the clock for the ULA. The ULA then generates the clock for the CPU itself. And here on the left hand side we have the TV video modulator because this uh, machine only comes with an RF modulator output. It doesn't come with composite or anything else. Now the composite output is actually the first mod I'd like to do. However, the owner of this machine, Becca, asked me to keep the machine as original as possible. So I'm not going to do any permanent modification in this machine. At the same time, I don't have an RF TV or tuner or anything, so I have to extract the composite output of this board. And then when I'm done with everything, I'll just revert it back to as it was. First thing first, I think I would like to check that the uh, power supply is actually outputting the 9 volts DC that it says is outputting, so let's check that. Uh, oh well, we got 13 volts, but again, this is without a load. It's probably totally fine, but just to be on the safe side, let's add the load and see how it behaves with a load. And you can see that at 1.2 amps, we are down to 9.3 volts. So that seems totally fine. The voltage is high only when there is no load. So the transformer is working perfectly fine. Now, before I power this board, I'd like to remove everything I can from the board, just in case something is wrong with the board or the power supply section. So let's uh, turn on the transformer and let's take some readings. In three, two, one, go. 
Okay, transformer is on. I'm now measuring the minus five voltage. It's minus 4.5, it's fine. The service manual says it has to be in between minus four and minus 5.5, so this is totally fine. The 12 volts is spot on, and the five volts is also spot on. And I'm now measuring the video 12 volts, uh, which is also acceptable, it should be within tolerance. So all the voltages seems to be fine. I would say the next step would be to do the little modification for the composite, and then we can power this up and see whether we get a picture out of it. Now, what I need to do, I need to remove this wire because this uh, pad on the PCB is where the composite signal is coming into the modulator. So by removing this wire, I have, a, I have access to the uh, composite signal directly. I'm going to solder this little contraption. It's an RCA connector and there is a capacitor which connects the uh, output of the composite signal to the positive pin or the signal pin of the RCA connector. Reason is there is an offset of, I think it's about two volts on the output of this uh, computer. So the capacitor will just remove the offset. Will it work? Let's find out. Let's power up in three, two, one, go. Um, well, well, the good news is we got the, the green frame, which I don't know what it means, uh, but it's not really working, is it? Um, so I'm not sure what's happening here. Well, I guess this machine needs a little bit of a diagnostic. I would say before I start digging into the PCB here, I understand there is a diagnostic ROM that can be installed in place of this one, but it's not just a plug and play ROM. Uh, there's some modification to be done to the PCB. So let me find out about those modifications. Well, I didn't do anything. I just restarted and it works. So I'm not sure what happened before that, but it seems to be working. Maybe it had been powered off for a while, I don't know. Well, it seems to be working fine. The video is a bit fuzzy and uh, I think it should look better than that, but we'll take a look at that at some point. What I'd like to do now is just to burn that diagnostic ROM and test the machine thoroughly. And the machine, by the way, is not working anymore. And again, I haven't done anything. I just restarted it. So it looks like there is an intermittent fault on this machine. Okay, the ROM is in, let's uh, test this and see what happens. In three, two, one, go. Okay, <laughs> well, we got something out of it. Now, not being familiar with this um, diagnostic ROM is I don't really know what to expect on screen. I see they're like double characters somehow, but I think it's uh, testing the memory. And that's probably the outcome of the memory test. It's just, it's unreadable. So that is telling me that something is working on this board. It's not completely dead. And as a very starting point, I would say, let me use some contact cleaner on the ULA because the ULA is the IC responsible for the video generation. So maybe that's a good starting point. No, that didn't help. If you're enjoying this video, then it's a good time to hit the like button down below and also to consider subscribing to the channel if you like this kind of things. As you can see, I'm not a professional and putting these videos together requires quite a lot of time, so your support, your help is really, really helpful and really appreciated. As is the help of today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay offer many services, but the core one is PCB manufacturing, and uh, surprisingly, there are plenty of projects for the ZX Spectrum. I found this website, Project Specky. It's full of public projects. You can download the Gerber files there, upload them on PCBWay.com, place an order, and uh, 
PCB Way will deliver the PCBs manufactured at your home. I have used PCB Ways myself in many of my projects on this channel. The quality of the PCBs is always excellent and I do recommend them and I also thank them for their help because they make this channel possible. Take a look at PCBWay.com, the link is also down below in the description. Thank you very much PCBWay for your help and now let's go back to the ZX Spectrum. Well, as a starting point, I would do, you know, the usual test. So let's check the clock, the reset line, make sure there's nothing weird on the address line and uh, data lines on the CPU itself. So let's begin with the clock. Here is our clock, it's 3.43 megahertz, which is expected, so that's totally fine. Let's check the reset line. Reset line should be stay low for a moment and then go high, as in disable the reset itself. So it's powered off right now. Let's power on again in three, two, one, go. Well, um, it's going up slowly. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that is intentional, so we keep that in mind. Let's make sure we have five volts coming into this processor on pin 11. And we do have five volts, so that is fine. Well, at this point, I'll go through all the address line and all the data lines and, you know, looking for something which is weird. So let's take a look. This is pin 30, which is address line zero. And, you know, I'll continue and make sure they are more or less all like that. Well, all address lines seem to be healthy. If I wanted to be a bit lazy, considering that it looks like there is some code happening in the background, it would be very easy for me to just swap the ULA because it's socketed and I have another one. Uh, everything else besides the ROM is socketed. So I would say, let's go ahead and swap the ULA and see if that by any chance is our problem. Okay, I've got a replacement ULA, and by the way, this is coming from another untested ZX Spectrum, so I have no idea whether this is working or not, but I don't know, let's uh, give that a go and let's power on and see what happens in three, two, one, go. Oh, it's working. Okay, so it looks like we have a faulty ULA, even though I still see some, um, some issues with the video, um, but I don't really know whether that's my capture device or whether there's an issue here with the computer, but it's definitely readable. It's doing a test right now, so let's see what it says. The test is telling me that there might be an issue with the upper RAM. Now that's the lower RAM, the lower 16K, and this is the upper RAM, the, uh, the, the extra 32K, and it's specifically IC20, which is this little one here. Now, because I'm not too familiar with the ZX Spectrum, I've had a chat with Lee of Make Fun Making It. It's an amazing channel. I would definitely recommend you find the link down below in the description. And he recommended that as a starting point on any ZX Spectrum of this age, I should replace the capacitor. I don't like replacing capacitors just for the sake of doing it, but he explained me why, and I'd like to show you why it would be a good idea. Right, what I've done here, I put some uh, masking tape on the heatsink, because the heatsink is made of aluminium, is reflecting infrared, so you can't really see the actual temperature of the heatsink through a thermal camera. What you see here is the ZX Spectrum has been powered for, I don't know, probably 15 minutes, not more than that. And you can see that these I see here, which is the ULA, is already running about 75 degrees. And the heatsink is not any cooler than that. I have to say, if I'm touching it, I'm burning my fingers. So imagine this little computer with the heatsink running at 75 degrees and uh, the ULA running at 75 degrees, plus bits and bobs around, in a small enclosure running for potentially hours. It's a small oven. So there is a good chance that these capacitors have gone. Now, as a quick test, I would say, let's take a look at this one which is close to the heatsink and see how it reads. And based on that one, we'll decide whether to replace them all or maybe just test them or just leave as, as they are. This is supposed to be a 22 microfarad. It's exactly twice as much. So clearly Lee is right, is familiar with these machines. This capacitor is completely out of spec. The ESR is not too bad for a 22 microfarad, but I would say still a bit too high, but it's probably not horribly high. 
and the replacement is reading 22 microfarad 0.65 ESR. As you can see, the existing one is wildly out of specs. So let's go ahead and replace them all. <laughs> Now, I've spoken with Rebecca, the owner of this machine, and if you remember, she said she wanted the machine to be as stock as possible. Now, I've explained her the problematic here with the temperatures and some modifications which would be required in order to make this machine working better. So we had a quick chat on the subject and she told me that she doesn't mind if I restore, if I improve the guts of the unit, as long as the shell of the unit is the same and as long as the RF output is still working at the end of the process. So I went on the Retrolium website, you'll find the link down below in the description. It's an amazing website, they have plenty of spare parts for ZX Spectrums, Commodore 64 and machines like that. And I purchased a capacitor replacement kit and it comes with more or less the same, or at least they're blue and they are axial rather than radial. Or radial so they look more original. It comes with the components to perform a required modification to the power supply section, and that is in the service manual that was requested by Sinclair itself, so that's part of the uh, normal service of the machine. Also, I got a heatsink for the ULA. Now, the only downside of placing a heatsink on the ULA is that the ULA will have to be installed on the PCB itself, so I'll have to remove the socket, unfortunately, and that's because there's not enough clearance to have a heatsink on top of the ULA with the keyboard on, that's a bit unfortunate. Finally, I've got this little modern voltage regulator. This is a 5 volts voltage regulator, it's suitable for Commodore 64 or these machines as well, and this is going to replace this linear one, so I can get rid of the heatsink, and these are not generating any heat at all, so this whole radiator, which is here, like space heater on the right hand side of the unit, is going to be gone for good. Now, as a starting point, I would say let's swap these capacitors and let's also swap the voltage generator and then we'll continue the diagnostic and I'll perform the rest of the um, improvements towards the end of the video. And uh, on issue two boards like this, mind the orientation of C46, which is printed incorrectly on the PCB itself. Okay, well, it's all done. For now, we've got all the capacitors and the voltage regulator. Most of the capacitors were off. I think there were just two or three which were still reading okay-ish, but the ESR was still too high. So it's definitely a good idea to replace them all. Three, two, one, go. Well, it's still working. We still have the noise on the video. And again, I will have to check on my monitor whether that's my capture device or the actual board. But well, let's see whether the RAM error has gone or not. And no, it looks like we still have a faulty memory socket mo memory module. Now, before we blindly replace it, uh, let's just do a quick test with the oscilloscope. Well, first thing first, let's make sure that we got five volts on the IC. There it is, we got five volts, that's totally fine. And what I can do, I can compare IC20 with IC21 and see if there's any, you know, obvious difference on an address line or anything. But we checked the address line and the data lines on the CPU. I couldn't see anything wrong, so I'm probably not expecting to see anything here. No, I don't see anything obviously wrong, so I would say let's just replace the IC. Let's hope the software is correct.
Okay, well, the RAM IC is replaced. Let's power on and let's see if it works this time. In three, two, one, go. <laughs> well, we now have IC19, which is faulty. So I'm wondering whether IC20 was actually faulty, but it could also be 19 and 20 faulty and 20 is the first one on the line. And then it went to 19. What shall I do? Shall I replace 19 as well? or not. The thing with this is I can't socket these ICs unfortunately because with the socket then the keyboard doesn't fit anymore so these have to be on the PCB so it's not easy to just play and, and swap things around unfortunately. It's not too bad to desolder them but uh, yeah it's not as easy as on a Commodore 64. It's the following day and uh, I've made quite a few discoveries over the past few hours. Uh, so let me go on and explain you what happened. First thing first, I have to apologize about that poor um, video quality that you've been seeing through my capture device. I thought there was something wrong with the ZX Spectrum. And it turns out that this is um, not working as it's supposed to because I plugged the ZX Spectrum straight into my monitor and it looks totally fine. So I'm looking into that and for now I switched to my older composite um, converter, which is not great, but it's definitely better than that horrible garbage that that thing was displaying. So apologies for that. Now, the next discovery is that I stumbled into my other ZX Spectrum and uh, I was totally mistaken when I said I can't use sockets on the memory ICs. Uh, I can, because obviously this is using it. What I can't have is the socket under the ULA and the heatsink on top. That will clash with the keyboard. But everything else, as you can see, can be socketed. So I'll go ahead and install a socket under the IC that I installed and I'll also install a socket for IC19 so we can test another memory module and see whether that works. Okay, the RAM ICs are socketed and I've replaced IC19 as well. Let's power up and let's see what it does this time. In three, two, one, go. Yay, it seems to be working. Now we haven't got any more memory errors. Fantastic, so it was just two ICs. Okay, well, I plugged the keyboard to run more tests using the diagnostic ROM and uh, when I powered up the unit, it ran the memory test again and uh, this happened. Yes, it's now reporting IC21 as faulty. However, the strange thing is that if I just press zero and I restart the diagnostic, so if, we, if it redoes exactly the same test, it then passes perfectly fine. And actually this, the very same test is under five more RAM tests and it's called the silent 48K RAM test loop, which is number eight. And I can run this test for as long as I want and it never fails. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Again, I can power it off and on again now, which is, you know, it's kind of worm and it fails, but every subsequent test will pass each one of them. I don't really understand. The only thing I can think of is the IC is a bit marginal, just a tiny amount and something is different when it's just being powered up and that's enough to trigger the error. So maybe what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna socket the IC21 as well and I can try and replace the IC. If the error goes away, well, I guess maybe it's a good thing. If it doesn't, uh, then I don't know. <laughs> Will it work? I'm not too convinced about that, but let's try. In three, two, one, go. Well, it's working now. <laughs> well, I, well, it was working before, so I don't know. Um, but it's working, I would say happy days. 
Right, before another memory module fails, I'd like to perform the DCDC uh, modification, which is uh, detailed in the service manual. And for that, I need to replace a resistor and I need to add a capacitor. So let me show you. When I ordered the capacitor replacement kit, I also got these parts for this modification. It comes with a resistor to replace this one here, which is R60. And then I'll have to add this capacitor in between the uh, positive leg of this capacitor here and uh, the left hand side leg of R58. So let's do that. Let's uh, first of all make sure that everything still works. In three, two, one, go. Yeah, all is good. What I'm gonna do now, I'm going to plug the keyboard so we can do some more tests. Okay, let's check the keyboard, key number one, and I'll go through all the keys and see if they all work. They all work, I'm actually pretty impressed. I was totally expecting this not to work, so happy days. Now, one of the tests is the speaker. I haven't heard the speakers at all. I'm not sure whether it's supposed to play any sound or anything, but there is a test in here. Number three. Okay. Well, I don't hear anything. So sounds like the speaker's not working. Okay, so I had a look at the schematics and yes, the uh, speaker is driven by the ULA and the circuit is pretty easy to be honest. There's not much. There's a couple of diodes and then it goes to the speaker. So the first thing I want to do is to make sure the speaker has some sort of continuity. I think it should be about, what is that, 20 or 40 ohms. So let's have a look. Oh, okay. Well, 2.8 mega ohms is definitely not what I would expect from a speaker. So, unfortunately, it looks like the speaker is gone. Now, to double check that, I guess I can use my oscilloscope and see whether there is any sound going to the speaker when I'm testing the speaker. Okay, so let's run the speaker test now. And yes, there is a signal and it's changing in frequency. It's a very crude signal, but I think that's what ex what's expected during this test. And uh, I guess this is what this machine can do. So it is definitely working, and uh, but the speaker is not working, which is a shame. That's another fault. Now, out of curiosity, let's check the other ZX Spectrum and see what the speaker is reading here. Well, uh, <laughs> it looks like we might have two faulty speakers. Yes, it's reading 3.2 mega ohms in one direction, but the speaker is definitely, definitely broken. That's a shame. Well, without a speaker, there's only one way you can test that the sound is actually coming out of the system, besides the oscilloscope, of course, and is using headphones. So I plug the headphones in the ear plug and let's run the sound test and let's see what we can hear for out of it. Well, this is such a simple test, but the sound capabilities of this unit are very, very limited. So, well, we know it works. We know that ULA is working, which is great. I need to find a new speaker. It's not super easy as the more popular speakers are for the issue three onwards, which are like 40 ohm speakers. Well, this one, I was mistaken earlier on, this one is 200 ohms and they can't be exchanged, of course. So I'm trying to source a 200 ohm speaker for these spectrum. Now, while I was browsing the diagnostic, I found this menu, it's menu six, which has a bunch of extra tests. And uh, I tried number one, which is ULA analysis. And I've noticed this. It comes out with this error message that says, error, ear stuck high. Now ear, which I guess it stands for earphone, but it's basically one of the input output at the back of the unit is where we plug the um, earphone just a minute ago to hear the actual sound coming from the unit. And this says it's stuck high, but we had sound before uh, and it doesn't make sense. Now the ear, the microphone, the mic input or output and the speaker, they're all coming from the same pin from the ULA, which is pin 28. So I would say, let's take a look at that one, but we had sound before, so I I'm not sure what to find here. Yeah, and it's definitely not stuck high. I'm running the speaker test now. 
it doesn't look stuck high to me. So I don't really know what that error message is about. Now there's one thing I'd like to try to see if by any chance that is the cause of our error message and is what if the speaker which is open so it's not there is somehow triggering this error message within the software. So I have a 267 ohm resistor here which should approximate a speaker. So what I'm going to do I'm going to solder this resistor across the speaker terminal. So I'm basically replacing the faulty speaker with a fake speaker. From an electronic perspective, it should be more or less the same. So let's see if by any chance that changes anything within that test. I've now got the 200 ohm resistor across the speaker. Let's run the test and see if it gives the same error message. And no, we don't have the error message. So clearly with the speaker open, something goes wrong with the diagnostic and you got that weird the ear is stuck high. Thankfully, the ULA is working because I didn't have another one to test. And yes, the ULA is a 5C type, so the test is definitely correct. I've run all the tests of the diagnostic and they're now all passing, so this is great. What's left to do to this unit is to test it with some software, which I think I can load through the ear port, so we can test it as well. And then, as a final step, I think I'd like to um, calibrate the video output. Now, for both of these tasks, I need the original ROM back in. Um, so I would say, let's remove the diagnostic ROM, and then we can try and give this um, Sinclair ZX Spectrum a final test. Now, that is the perfect screen to adjust the um, video output. Let me show you. Now, my understanding is that I need to adjust these VR1 and VR2 until the line representing the, the white is as flat as possible, with less ripple as possible. Let's try and play with this, because I never tried this myself. So the idea is to lower this, to play with these controls, until this is minimized. VR1 is a bit stuck, so let me put a little bit of contact cleaner in both of them. Aha, that's it, that's better. Well, I think this is the best I can do. Is it better than it was before? Maybe a little bit, but not too much. Let's see how it looks now. Oh yes, it's actually grey, it's not yellow anymore. Now a couple of final adjustments is this trimmer here to make sure that we have the PAL frequency burst for the color burst of the signal itself and it's supposed to be 4.433619. It's not too far away but I guess we can try and improve on that one. There we go, 4.43361, so that's totally fine. Now the other adjustment, I need to see the picture on screen. Well, that was my first program written on the ZX Spectrum. I have to admit the, the way that you have to use the keyboard is pretty quirky, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. I understand why they wanted to do that. Anyways, the next step would be to adjust these trimmer here to minimize the crawling on, uh, on the color bars. Well, this is great. I guess now I can try and load some software on this thing and actually test the machine. I think it's about time. I've been trying to load software on this machine for a while. Eventually, I found this software called Outlab, O-T-L-A. Let me show you what I managed to do. So this is the software I'm talking about and all I need to do, I have to click on new plus add. Uh, this is one I've been testing, click on open. Click on OK, just select the model of my Sinclair ZX, it's the 48 kilobyte. Now on the Sinclair, I have to select load and then quote, quote, and enter. Now it should be listening for something and all I have to do is to press play. And it's definitely loading something. And it works! It took me forever. So that's telling me that this Sinclair, besides the sound, is working totally fine. And this is actually a pretty cool game.
A few days have passed and there's a little plot twist because uh, Phil at Rosholim was able to find me 200 ohm speakers for the ZX Spectrum issue too, so I can fix this machine 100% and finally been able to hear the amazing beeping sound. And yes, it's reading what it's supposed to read, 200 ohms, and second one, 207. So as expected, they're working. Let's get one and uh, install it on the PCB then. Well, it's working. It is so amazing. I have to say, I am so impressed by this little machine, considering it was 1982 and it can do so many things in, in this very small form factor. Right, um, there is one last thing that I need to do and is to fit this machine into the bigger case and make sure the keyboard works, replace all the missing screws, give it a clean, and then I guess it's ready to go. So this machine is now perfectly working. We replaced three memory modules, one speaker and the ULA, which is unfortunate as it's the most expensive part of the computer, it's the core of the computer. Now, before I put this back together, I will revert my video output modification. As Becca said, she wants these working with the CRT television, so it will need to have the RF modulator working. Now I'm not gonna solder the ULA on the PCB so it can work with the heatsink and the original case yet because I have another ZX Spectrum to fix and I only have one working ULA which is the one in this machine so I'll have to borrow it at some point for the other machine to work. Pretty impressed by this little machine, 1982. It is so impressive to think that this little machine you, can, you could program on it, you could play games, you have color, you have some sort of sound, absolutely mind-blowing. I do understand why this machine launched the whole British industry, the whole uh, IT industry back in the days. Well, I guess this is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I did, as this was my first ZX Spectrum. If you also did, I'd appreciate a thumb up down below and also consider subscribing to this channel if you like this kind of things. If you also want to leave a comment, I do my best to read them all and to reply to them all. So please go ahead and leave a comment. For now, thank you for watching. I wish you a great day and I hope to see you again soon here on this channel for my next videos. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye.